Hello, I'm John Cox, president of Cape Cod Community College. This week, our nation comes together to celebrate Veterans Day. As an institution with a long history of serving both active military personnel and returning veterans, we're proud to join this celebration with a week of impressive speakers joining us via Zoom. These sessions have been organized by our Veteran Support Club, which helps our student veterans navigate higher education and government resources, while also elevating general awareness about the cultures, social backgrounds, and barriers of the veteran and military community. Even in times of turmoil or unrest, our veterans are constant. We encourage you to pause and reflect on their immense sacrifice and valor and the support they require from our community when they return home. We hope you enjoy the series and we'll see you here on these Zoom sessions. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Amber Olson and I'd like to thank you for attending the first of our week-long Veterans Week. Um, Special thanks to student engagement, um, to the Office of Student Engagement, especially Asher Hamilton, the school's mil and also the school's military and veterans advisor, John Alexander, the college events department, the Tilden Arts Center for making this possible. Today's presentation is about a complicated subject matter that affects more than just the military community. I am proud to introduce Judith um, Berger, Providence BMAC MST coordinator, licensed clinical social worker, who is here today to talk to us about the real barriers that service members face. Um, Judith. Hi, uh, everybody. Thank you for um, inviting me to join you um, today. Um, and I also want to uh, thank the uh, veterans um, the Veterans Club at Cape Cod Community College for recognizing um, the topic military sexual trauma that I'm going to talk about. I think it's often something that um, people don't think about when they think of different traumas and experiences that service members have. And I know a lot of survivors of military sexual trauma feel that they're not really veterans or that they don't, don't count or that it's less important uh, than what other veterans in encounter. So I think including this topic in your um, Veterans Day lineup will mean a lot to, to survivors all over. So thank you. Um, I am going to start by reading a brief poem that was written by um, a survivor of military sexual trauma, a male, uh, male army veteran. Um, he has actually since passed away, um, but he had given it to me um, years ago and he and said I could use it um, as needed. So I'm going to, to read the poem. Why is it that I don't sleep well? Why is it that I don't eat right? Why is it that I don't have many friends? Why is it that I have lost interest, interest in things that I once found enjoyable? Why is it that I fear most people I come in contact with? Why is it that I don't trust most people? Why is it that I have difficulty being intimate with a woman? Why is it that I sometimes fantasize about both men and women whom I have seen recently? Why is it that I have such a low tolerance for things other people say or do? Why is it that I can't concentrate long enough to enjoy reading a book? Why is it that I don't feel comfortable when surrounded by others, such as at a baseball game? Why is it that I don't take a liking to doctors, lawyers, policemen, politicians, etc.? Why is it that I trust and love animals more than I do people? Why is it that I can't forgive myself when it's not my fault what happened to me? Why is it that I never had any children? Why is it that more often than not, I hate myself? Why is it that of the three relationships I've had as an adult, I was treated, cheated on by two of the three women? Why is it that I have spent a small fortune on alcohol, drugs, and tobacco? Why is it that I could never hold on to a job for more than a year? Why is it that I sometimes laugh at things that aren't really funny? I could go on and on with this, but honestly, I believe that I died when I was raped in September 1980. If only someone had remembered to bury me. 
so I'm going to um, now kind of move on. I thought that kind of nicely sets the stage, um, kind of talks about a lot of the symptoms. Um, so actually I can move the slide. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about sexual trauma in general um, and that um, sexual trauma, oh, next slide. Sorry, yep. Um, sexual trauma really alters a sense of safety and stability that, um, um, to the core of some of someone's sort of existence, it is perpetrated by another human being. Um, often, the perpetrator is a friend, an intimate partner, someone else who's trusted. Um, it involves profound violation of boundaries and sense of personal integrity for the survivor. Um, and an interpersonal trauma like sexual trauma really has profound implications for survivors understanding of relationships and themselves and the world um, it is particularly true and um, actually you know like we know any additional every subsequent trauma sort of builds and adds to the one before when someone is young and the trauma is chronic and repeated we know that this makes the experience and the implications for their life even more complicated. Um, all trauma alters the sense of stability, gives a loss of predictability. Um, it alters relationships with oneself, with others in the world, especially in the areas of trust, power and control and esteem. Um, sexual trauma um, kind of all the more so um, because of that interpersonal component, that it's not just the world, it's sort of other people. And we, as social human beings, we need to be able to en encounter and interact with other human beings. And there needs to be some sort of sense of, of trust um, of other people. Um, next slide. Um, next slide. Sorry. OK. Um, so just kind of, so that was sort of sexual trauma in general. And when we look at what is military sexual trauma, military sexual trauma is a um, kind of definition used by the Department of Defense and the VA. And it is combined what we typically in the civilian world would address as sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, so MST includes sexual harassment, which is typically defined as unwelcome verbal um, or kind of conduct of a sexual nature that occurs in a workplace or kind of training center. Um, so this might be um, unwanted sexual attention. This might be name calling of a sexual nature. This might be um, a highly sexualized environment where there are a lot of sexual jokes, videos. Um, people might be forced to watch certain kind of pornography or, or things with other sexual content um, that makes somebody uncomfortable. Um, sexual assault is sexual activity between at least two people um, in which someone is involved against his or her will. Um, there might be physical force, there might not be. Um, this would also include rape, and rape would be kind of a kind of sexual assault that involves penetration of a body orifice with a part of a body or an object. Um, sexual assault also includes touching people against their will, even if it's not rape. So, right, this could be um, touching people in their genital areas, on breasts. Um, and again, this is, would be against their will. In the military and other environments that have strict power and control structures, um, people can actually experience harassment and sexual assault and feel that they're not able to say no. And certainly this can be outside of strong power and control structures, but in the military, um, the fact that saying no to someone of higher command is usually not permitted. Um, this can lead to feeling pressured for sexual, in you know, sexual relationship with somebody, even if that's not what uh, the person wants. Um, military sexual trauma does not discriminate. It happens to men, women, um, persons who might be transgender uh, across all ethnic and racial groups, cultural groups. Um, men are assaulted by women and other men. Women are assaulted by women and other men. Um, this is not clearly not just a women's issue, and it's not clearly is not just a um, sort of male on male sexual assault issue. Anyone who has greater power than another person in a power structure can um, certainly perpetrate military sexual trauma. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so. Currently, um, in the past year, we have had 876 um, 
veterans who report military sexual trauma. These report is taken by a screening question um, where we ask people a direct question about whether they've experienced military sexual trauma. Um, I have the breakdown here, it's men. We have 374 men and 502 women. Um, this is, it's, it, historically it had been really um, split 50-50. Things are starting to skew now as we have more women coming out of the military. Um, again, this is simply based on people's answer to a question. I certainly know that I have had um, men that I have been treating for kind of combat related trauma. And when I, they find out that I also have this job, they'll say things like, there's something I need to tell you. So we definitely know that there are people out there who are not being screened, who are not answering yes to a screening question, um, who might not even realize what happened to them or not ready to disclose it. So again, these are estimates, but certainly we would, um, there are more uh, people out there than these numbers would would indicate. Um, some recent studies suggest that sexual military sexual trauma, including assault and um, and uh, sexual harassment, um, range in numbers from two to two percent to seventy percent in the military. So depending on the study and the cohort, um, they a vast range. The general accepted numbers are that um, about two percent of men report sexual assaults. Um, so that'd be sexual assault specifically, and about 20% of women report sexual assault specifically. So that is not taking into account um, sexual harassment. Um, next slide. Um, in the military context, there are some things about the military that kind of lead to sexual trauma being um, slightly different than sexual trauma in this age group in other environments. Um, there are aspects of military culture um, that kind of leave people feeling more helpless and isolated. Um, there is a high value placed on loyalty and teamwork, right? These are our brothers and sisters in arms. These are the people who've got to have our back. And when some, when if there's a disruption in this teamwork and one person is a perpetrator and another person is a victim and they need to maintain this sense of cohesion, this can be particularly disruptive. Um, People who join the military are trained to be warriors. The, uh, the construct of being a survivor of a sexual assault, i.e. a victim and a warrior often doesn't go well together, right? It's, it's a complicated um, kind of dialectic to balance um, that we can be strong and things can happen to us. Um, I think that for women and for um, certainly for um, people of color, or other minorities, this is actually all the more so, right? They already feel they have to prove themselves uh, more. And yet this is sort of another thing that they need to kind of prove themselves at least more. Um, so this is um, also, Usually um, there's a unique kind of trapped feeling in the military. You can't just leave and go home and see your family for the weekend. You can't easily um, get to friends. Certainly if this occurs in boot camp, your phone calls might even be monitored. You might be in a place where you can't even get a, uh, a phone call that's private to, to talk to a family member or a friend and get social support. So often things that we know are protective in recovery from sexual assault, social support, people who are going to believe you, um, are, are kind of cut off, you might be cut off from. Um, and certainly for men, there's certainly the cultural sort of taboo about men talking about these things. So there's, there's um, that as well. Um, also, historically, anyone who was injured in an assault would need to ask their command for permission to go to sick call. And what if that's the person who assaulted you? Or what if it was his or her best friend or close comrade or someone they worked with? You know, so this also becomes a problem. Um, that has changed um, in the past several years. There are um, ways to report through the sexual assault response coordinator. Um, so the idea being that we can help service members get the help they need without having to go through their command, recognizing that sometimes the command might be the perpetrator. Um, however, you know, these are clearly imperfect. Certainly, um, you know, it doesn't take too, too much for people to realize when someone's missing um, or, or, or not around. So I think that these can also be really, really challenging. Um, because of the fact that um, survivors are eating, working, 
recreating with a potential perpetrator. Um, they're also dependent on a system that might have perpetrated or protected a perpetrator and the perpetrator for their survival. In this way, um, sexual trauma, military sexual trauma is considered a betrayal trauma, and it can present very similar to incest, where a, a uh, survivor is dependent on a perpetrator or the perpetrator system to um, also feed them and keep them safe and house them, et cetera. Um, I just had added in um, some quotes from different um, survivors. Um, and this is when I felt like I was weak, I let them break me, right? So this is sort of what happened to me. Um, next slide. And then I have another kind of quote here, which I, I think really speak so strongly about people's experiences. This is another male. Um, I feared my own comrades more than I feared the enemy. I kept a knife strapped to my bunk at all times. It was not going to happen again. I still have a knife close to my bed. My own bedroom is not safe. Nowhere is safe. And this has not changed over the years. I am always afraid. And again, you know, as I had mentioned, this is occurring. This is a trauma that's occurring where the victim lives and works. Um, there is a high ongoing risk of re-victimization. Um, I know I worked with one woman who was gang raped um, by several different, you know, obviously a gang, I think there were five of them. And for 10 months, they repeatedly returned to assault her every week, different groups of them. So again, there's a high risk for re-victimization. Um, again, increased feelings of powerlessness. There's nowhere to turn. People might not believe me. I might be told I wanted it or I, I shouldn't have been drunk. Um, certainly, especially women who might be drinking underage and they report an assault, the, the issue then becomes the fact that they were drinking underage, not the fact that they were assaulted. Um, the threat of death or physical harm is very real. No one knows more than the, the service member, him or herself, of what their fellow uh, service members are trained to be able to do. Um, and certainly, you know, recently with um, what we've seen happening at Fort Hood, I know several of my survivors are saying, see, it's real. It's real what they can do. Um, so this is sort of, you know, um, has been their sort of greatest fear. And now they tend to see it played out. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, kind of transition to um, what can happen as a result of, of experiencing military sexual trauma. Um, survivors can have reactions all across the board. And I think this is really important for educators, peers, providers, you know, everybody to know. We can't determine whether something happened to someone by how they're behaving, right? We've certainly heard people say things like, oh, well, he or she's not acting like she was assaulted. What does that look like, um, right? We don't know what that looks like. Um, people can be extremely impulsive. People can be extremely controlled. We can have a lot of independence, right? I don't need anybody. People can't be trusted. And we can also fear being alone. Maybe when I'm alone, I can't distract myself from my thoughts and my memories. Um, people can have really intense emotions that seem to spill out everywhere. And they can be really controlled with their emotions. Um, and this can switch within minutes or hours or days. Um, and these responses can last for years and decades. Um, and to be aware that um, there's not a right way to respond. Um, when people are really struggling with a lot of intense emotions um, and they're experiencing their uh, traumatic event, memories actually store differently. So often they might not remember details. They might, might remember details sequentially. Some of the details might shift. And this does not mean they're lying. This might mean that they took in different information at different times. Uh, the body was focused on surviving. So it wasn't as focused in you know, what color shirt the perpetrator may or may not have been wearing. Um, so I think it's really important um, as people who work with survivors or might encounter survivors that we make sure that we don't judge our own preconceived ideas of how someone who's been assaulted or is reporting a trauma might um, might respond. Next slide. Um, there are certainly several, you know, many mental health diagnoses that can be associated um, with experiencing military sexual trauma. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder usually comes to mind. Certainly military sexual trauma is a trauma. 
Um, however, not everyone who experiences military sexual trauma develops post-traumatic stress disorder, right? This is just a, a group of criterion symptoms that people have put together. And we know that people don't really fit in boxes that well. Um, often depression is all, right? Major depressive disorder, other unspecified depressive disorders are seen widely in survivors. Substance use and substance dependence are rampant. Um, certainly we know that the military usually encourages substance use as a way to cope. Um, same with kind of first responders. So often early on, this is what survivors turn to to help them cope. Um, we also have um, eating disorders, dissociative disorders, um, borderline personality disorder, complex PTSD. This might develop if someone had had a lot of previous childhood trauma and the military sexual trauma kind of compounded that. Um, I know I have several survivors of childhood trauma who they went into the military because they thought it was going to be a new family, a new life. Um, they were going to get the tools to start over and then they encountered um, you know, another assault. Um, we have many people who, who pre present to medical care, um, lower back pain, headaches, pelvic pain, chronic fatigue, right? Struggling with trauma. Any trauma takes a toll on the body. And sometimes this manifests in physical health, in physical health problems. We know that trauma, living with trauma increases uh, inflammation in the body. So we see a whole host of um, of physical health problems that might um, not kind of they sort of elude diagnosis or they kind of are, aren't easily treated and sometimes this might be the, the cause. Um, next slide. Um, and certainly many people who experience um, military sexual trauma and sexual trauma in general do okay, right? We don't want to imply that everybody who experiences sexual trauma is unable to recover in any way, but most people do struggle in some areas, right? They might not meet a DSM-5 diagnosis, but they might have relationship problems. They might struggle with employment problems, right? Any situation where maybe someone has power control over them or their authority figures. They might just struggle readjusting after the military. Um, and certainly we don't want to discount sort of spirituality issues, um, kind of crises of faith and sort of why did this happen to me or why does this happen at all? Um, I often work closely with our chaplain here who's really quite wonderful and I've had several women, women mostly, who, who meet with her to sort of explore this and this is an important part of treatment as, opposed, as well as psychological treatment. Um, next slide. Um, I think it's also helpful um, for all of us as friends, providers, educators who might be working with survivors to recognize that survivors often worry and fear that they're going crazy. The symptoms don't make sense. Um, here, it was so confusing. For a while, all of it was confusing. Everything was confusing everywhere. I couldn't think about anything. Now it's confusing just thinking about how confusing it was. Trauma presents a challenge to our view of ourselves in the world. Um, symptoms and this crazy behavior often follow a logic and they serve a self-protective function if we look more closely. And even as friends or peers, if something like this comes up, helping a survivor recognize that his or her behaviors might actually have a rationale can be very grounding and stabilizing. Um, next slide. Um, so often, all of us need to survive. And when a trauma occurs, the fact that someone survived the trauma is already a win, right? They already got through it, but now they need to make sense of it. So there are often really healthy, normal survival needs that drive these symptoms. People, all people need to feel a sense of control. They need to cope and manage how they feel or their symptoms. All people need to feel a sense of safety. And we all tend to need to understand and find meanings in events. Um, and these are just sort of basic things that humans look for. So we can imagine when all of this feels as though it's been pulled out, what somebody might want to do. Um, so even purposeless or self-destructive behaviors might turn out to be serving a self-protective function. Um, these behaviors may have allowed the uh, victim to survive at a time, but have persist, persisted into different or inappropriate contexts. They also might represent the best efforts to deal with uncharted territory. I use an example of one woman I have who 
um, doesn't quite meet criteria for hoarding, but she has a, she amasses things in her home. And after a lot of, it took her many years to disclose this. And then we found out that after um, her assault, she started to fear leaving her room or in the barracks. So she started to buy huge quantities of deodorant, um, you know, snack foods, things like this, soap, anything she needed so that she didn't have to leave that often. And this behavior has now persisted 30 years later. Um, that she basically hunkers down in her house for fear of going out because part of her brain and body is still in the military. So we can kind of, and when we were able to help her recognize that it's not that she's a hoarder and her house is a mess, but that this was a survival technique that was really helpful for her. Um, and as we started removing things from the house, she actually said, I feel like I'm exposed and you're ripping off my band-aids. Um, so this was really, it was a really emotional process. Um, sometimes, you know, also looking at other symptoms um, that we might have, there might be um, self-blame. Self-blame is highly effective. It often helps someone having to confront the helplessness and the vulnerability of experiencing sexual trauma. Uh, if I believe that I had control and I just didn't exercise it, that might feel better than having to come to terms with the fact that people might be vulnerable in the world. Um, certainly not trusting people, it seems fairly obvious, right? I can prevent this from happening again. Um, substance use actually helps to calm the physiology and maybe tolerate social situations. Maybe it gives me the illusion that it's aiding in my sleep because I'm passing out and sleep is a problem. Um, maybe a lot of times we see a preoccupation with justice issues, very high sensitivity to any power and control dynamic. Um, this might be another way to prevent this from happening again or to protect other people. This also can sometimes be a way that a survivor might express outrage at a perpetrator's behavior. Um, Self-harm behaviors like cutting might be a way to distract from overwhelming feelings. Um, it helps to experience a more controllable pain and take away having to focus on the, the pain and the memories of the trauma. Um, boundary issues. Often, if someone's boundaries have been so profoundly violated, such as in sexual trauma and military sexual trauma, it makes it hard for someone to know what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and we might find that survivors trust too easily, right? They tell their whole story to someone or they don't trust at all. Um, so being aware that this is a way for them to kind of navigate vulnerability and try to, to feel safe in the world. Um, trying to think of some others. We have certainly emotional constriction or emotional numbing allows a survivor to only have to experience a small enough amount of emotion and avoid feeling overwhelmed. Um, dissociation, right, sort of becoming absent or kind of removing oneself from a situation. Um, when there's nothing someone can do to avoid the inevitable, this might be a good escape from chronic feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and hypervigilance. It's sort of a good break. Uh, I'm going to just have, I have a uh, quote here um, from a female survivor. Once I decided I wasn't responsible for getting raped, raped. That in a way was pretty terrifying because it meant it was not in my control and that the most terrible and fearful thing that ever happened to me was something that I had no control over whatsoever. Um, so I think that's really, again, better than I can say it sort of sums up how self-blame might, might be helpful and that this is something that we want to tread carefully with and validate how these thoughts might be helpful for somebody. Um, next slide. Um, so if somebody does disclose experiencing sexual trauma or military sexual trauma, in this case, to us, we want to keep in mind that healing starts with this disclosure, right? When someone tells us this, they're trusting us. And often, if someone discloses us, they're telling us they're the biggest thing they messed up in their life as this quote just kind of shown, right? The worst thing that they've done or that they let happen to them. So we really wanna keep, um, keep this in mind uh, if someone does disclose to us. If we're in a situation where we need to ask these questions, maybe we're trying to help someone um, you know, get access to services, um, we wanna be really clear about what information we need and why. So we wanna say, I just need to know yes or no, or I need a few sentences um, can be helpful. Next slide. 
um, again, I just sort of mentioned this, that there's a high probability of self-blame. Um, non-disclosure or avoidance has often been a coping mechanism. So if someone's disclosing to us, we have to recognize that they are now moving toward. They're doing something that's against how they may have been coping. And so we want to recognize that and um, we can use our presence to help survivors. Next slide. Um, our presence and our listening is actually the most valuable tool. Um, it's not doing nothing. Bearing witness to someone's experience as much as they choose to share um, and within the time constraints that we have is very powerful. Knowing that even if they blame themselves, maybe if you say it's not your fault and this is why I know why it's not your fault, that's very powerful. So don't, don't undermine that. Um, and I know sometimes we can feel right away that we need to get somebody to treatment because I, I don't have the, the tools for this. We can sometimes slow, slow things down and help someone maybe get to that place um, or recognize that maybe this is what they're, you know, assuming that they're not unsafe or anything like that, we can sometimes take some space and help them maybe get to a place where seeking treatment would be something they'd want to do. Also, it's important to recognize that someone might just be telling us this and they might otherwise be functioning okay. So we don't want to get into a place where we're assuming that they can't manage or that they can function. Um, often we know Jennifer Freud has, uh, Freud has done a lot of work um, with betrayal trauma and she's also looked at some um, behaviors that people engage in that are associated with um, survivors kind of having a more positive disclosure experience. And we actually know that leaning forward is helpful and some interruptions and in asking questions um, kind of reflective listening is extremely helpful. It shows that people are engaged in their story and listening. Um, we all can certainly relate to talking to a friend or family member or anybody, and we're telling this really emotional story and someone just says, uh-huh, 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 right? And we kind of realize that maybe they're not even there. So asking questions, clarifying, I didn't get that. Wait, what happened? You know, that's okay. And to not feel that we're invalidating someone in that way. Um, if we at any time need to ask someone these questions, um, or maybe we're concerned that, that something might have happened, it's always important to ask permission. So we are not in any way, even if our goal is to try to help, we have to remember that for a survivor, they're hypersensitive to power and control dynamics. And anytime we can help a survivor take back power and control, we are helping them. So being able to say, I'm going to ask you some questions, you know, I, is this okay? It's okay to say no. We're starting to explain and identify ourselves as someone who is not trying to, to harm or violate um, healthy power and control dynamics. Um, so I think that that can be really helpful. Um, Often survivors are going to have a very low threshold and they're hyper vigilant for sense that for any sign that they're getting a negative response. And this can feel like a fundamental betrayal. We also want to recognize that there's a high probability that in the past a survivor has disclosed and they might have been met with disbelief or minimizing. So we want to make sure that we kind of almost not be insincere or disingenuine, but we want to make sure that we're clear with our support um, and our understanding. We also want to be aware of our, our gender role and sort of the power and control dynamics. Um, so even asking questions like, I know you might, you know, you're talking to me, are you okay talking to me about this because I'm a man or I'm a woman or, or whatnot? Um, um, so I think that can be really important to keep in mind. Um, next slide. We all do this stuff, um, but just to kind of, if we are working with survivors, things like it's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay. We don't know that. Um, so we wanna to try to not use that. I know how you feel. I understand what you're going through. If, unless you're really well, willing to maybe disclose that you've had the same situation, um, that's not so helpful. Um, and again, we all do this. We all have that writing reflex to try to make things feel okay. Um, but sometimes we can be more supportive if we just say, you know, you're taking the first steps to getting help. 
Um, I can be here so you won't be alone. Um, you know, I can't imagine how painful this is for you. Certainly, if we know somebody um, and we know more personal characteristics of them that we could use in, you know, I know that you are really committed and you succeeded and you've gotten yourself here. I, you know, I'm, I'm confident that you can tackle this with the support you need, you know, things like that can sometimes also be, be really helpful. Um, so I think it also, if we say that, you know, I'm here to help you, we might want to be clear about what that help looks like. Um, because if, you know, we don't want to in any way kind of invalidate. Um, uh, next slide. Okay. Um, and also just, I kind of wanted to, you know, not everybody needs treatment. Um, it can help to have a guide or sort of a traveling companion and a source of support. Sometimes this can be a therapist. Sometimes this can be a friend or an aunt or um, a teacher or, you know, an advisor. So that, again, this does not have to um, be a therapist. And we want to make sure, again, that we don't force people into treatment, which could be, right, a power and control dynamic, um, especially in school. You know, hey, you're not doing well in school. You need to go to therapy to continue school. This might, there might be ways to have that conversation to um, explain facts and what's happening and ask you know, how the, the student, for example, might feel that he or she can get more support or things like that. So we want to make sure that we try to not mandate because then we can make therapy also become sort of a punishment. This bad thing happened to me. Now I'm struggling and somebody is now making me go talk about it or go to therapy. So we want to be just aware of those conversations. Um, um, which is sort of important. As I said here, we want to make sure survivor, survivors have healthy control. So we want to work with them. And really, um, even though sometimes maybe a coping strategy is to say, I don't have, um, I don't have control, we want to help them find ways to where they do have control. Um, and just to kind of, you know, again, I know this isn't a clinical presentation, but I wanted people to understand that often the, tr the treatment process, and again, in case you're talking to people about what treatment often looks like, um, it's usually the first step is what we call establishing safety, helping survivors be able to manage their emotions and begin to have some sense that they can influence their internal environment and their external environment. Certainly at this point, we also would want to be sure that they are safe in their housing, they have access to food, they're not in an abusive situation um, or anything like that. Um, this part of treatment might be all somebody does. It might be just a few weeks. Again, it depends on where, where the client is. Um, the next part is what we call remembering and mourning. And this is optional, but this is often where we do sort of what people call trauma processing or where we find ways to begin to process the trauma or go over the trauma. Um, and to, there are many different ways that we might do this. There's cognitive processing therapy, there's um, prolonged exposure, there's EMDR, um, there are other things like narrative therapy and so forth. So there are a wide variety of ways that we can approach the trauma. So in establishing safety, we're not approaching the trauma. Um, in remembering and mourning, we're approaching the trauma. We're starting to make sense of it and try to find meaning in where this fits in the survivor's life. Um, we all do better when something is where it should be. You know, is it it happened in the past and now I'm here. And often for survivors, it feels like the trauma might still be going on. So in remembering and mourning, we're starting to kind of find its place in the survivor's biography. And then the last part is sort of the reconnection and meaning making um, where we're kind of reconnecting with the world and taking the new things that we've learned about ourself, um, what, um, how the world might have changed, how we might see ourselves differently. And we are, um, kind of finding our life that takes into account the reality of the assault um, and hopefully the reality that we are not going to perpetually be assaulted and we can cope with what happened. Um, I have a, a little quote, this is from a male survivor um, who talked about therapy. It's like in the beginning, you just have this huge balloon and it's filled to the bursting and you're sitting there all the time, just holding the top tight. And you can't really do anything else because it's so big that you have to hold it all the time. And then you start letting it out just a little bit at a time. And slowly it gets smaller and smaller until eventually you can kind of tuck it in your back pocket or put it on a shelf and you can do other stuff, even though it's there. Um, so I really, I kind of like that. So that's kind of our goal, our goal in treatment.
um, in the next slide. Um, so the VA, um, starting in 1995, started to provide um, free care for survivors of military sexual trauma. This was slightly after the Tailhook Convention um, debacle, um, when sort of military sexual trauma and sort of the institutional acceptance of sexual trauma against women was sort of brought into the public view. So initially, um, military sexual trauma was provided for women. And about, I think, 18 months later, they extended that to men. Um, so survivors of military sexual trauma can get free care um, for any physical or mental health conditions related to military sexual trauma. They do not have to have a service connection um, a disability rating to do this. Um, most survivors of military sexual trauma are eligible for care, um, even if they might not el otherwise be eligible for VA care. There are some exceptions. Um, if people have had other than honorable discharges, there is a process and I, there are many different kinds of dis other than honorable discharges. And so we need to work um, with the Veterans Benefits um, Administration to determine how that's going to look. Um, let's see, In, to be eligible for military sexual trauma treatment at a VA or vet center, um, and the vet, I should also say that the vet centers, um, which typically only treat um, veterans who served in theater, also treat all military sexual trauma survivors. So that is, you do not have had to serve um, in a combat theater to be eligible for vet center treatment. And incidents for both the VA and the vet center do not need to have been reported at the time. We take the survivor's word for it. We don't ask them to prove it. If they say it happened, it happened. Um, Veterans can ask to meet with a provider of the same or opposite sex if it would make them feel more comfortable. That is actually a law. They have that right to ask for that. Um, and we certainly have residential and inpatient care available for veterans who might need more intensive treatment. Um, essentially, there is a uh, military sexual trauma treatment coordinator at every vet center and every VA. So all people need to do is to call a local VA and say, I need to speak to the military sexual trauma treatment coordinator. And actually twice a year, they go through and they call all the VAs in the country to um, evaluate the ease of access in reaching the military sexual trauma treatment coordinator. Um, I know you guys are out on the Cape, the Hyannis Vet Center has um, extensive treatment for military sexual trauma. And I know you're gonna hear about that later today. Um, also, the Hyann you're, you have the Hyannis um, CBOC, and they also have mental health providers who can provide treatment for military sexual trauma. Um, and now we, we do telehealth, and certainly the CAPE is in the catchment area for the Providence VA, so we can kind of reach everybody um, who might be looking for treatment. Um, if you are already connected with the VA, you can call the military sexual trauma treatment coordinator, or you can talk to your primary care doctor. It's really up to you. Um, and that person can take you through the, the whole process. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Um, so I, that's, um, and for anyone who's looking for treatment or for more information, I would encourage them to call um, definitely the military sexual trauma treatment coordinator um, in the Boston VA system, because um, I know that some people from the Cape might also kind of go to the Brockton system. Um, they are there, I, I'll give you their names. It's Leslie Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T and Ann Banducci, um, B-A-N-D-U-C-C-I. Again, you could just call the Boston system and say, I would like to speak to the military sexual trauma treatment coordinator, um, but you could also, um, and I don't actually have their number available, but you could um, also speak to one of them individually. Oh, and I see that Joshua is putting um, information right up um, on the chat. Hi, Judith. Um, that was absolutely incredible. Um, oh, thank you. The, um, I, I, a couple things that I really took from it, that uh, first opening poem is, um, is a lot. Um, I think that that really does set the, um, set the scene for uh, what we're talking about here. And it's, um, it, it's a lot. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. And um, I, I, I know that uh, he's, he's passed, but um, I, I appreciate the work that you did with that veteran to um, help him get to that point. That, um, 
Yeah, he loved to write. And actually, I had done a t-shirt project for April for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and people designed t-shirts that showed um, kind of their experience, you know, sort of an art kind of representation. He didn't want to draw. He said, I write. And he we framed this and, and hung it up, and he said, you can use it forever. So thank you. I love that. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session here before we sign off to try and talk. So I put into the chat, you can send me a chat message directly if you have any messages. Um, anything that you want us to talk about, feel free. Also, uh, we have a couple prepared. So I'll start with those and we will get over. Um, so you said that MST began in the VA in 1995. What, what it did it become? It's been going on since the beginning. Correct. Sorry. Uh, VA resources, MST, it became like an identified, um, recognizable thing that could you could have and you could be treated for. And it's a thing, you know, it's not a... Um, so what was it before that? If it, hey, I this happened to me in the military, what is what was it that's actually a really good question um and i from my um i wasn't around then um you know i came to the va in, in 2008 um i know just coming into i work in a clinic that has been in existence since 1981 um and i know that they did provide treatment to survivors um prior to that um, I don't think it was something that was, it was certainly not screened for widely. So I think it, you know, now all new veterans who come into the VA system are asked whether they experienced this. Um, and we know certainly research has showed that when you ask the question, you're increasing to get a likelihood of people just closing. Um, but I think before it would have just been um, whether or not someone chose to disclose it. Um, so there was no formal way to screen for it. And it would have been that someone came to a therapist and said, I need to talk about this. So they may have been being treated for combat PTSD. They may have been treated in general mental health and they had a, you know, someone who asked the question. Um, you know, sometimes when we ask general questions, like, have you ever experienced sexual, you know, assault or trauma? And people said yes, but there was no formal kind of, this is military sexual trauma. So that brings me right over. I want to talk to your position a little bit and what you actually do for the VA. Uh, quickly, I want to ask, uh, what motivates you to do this job? Did uh, you serve? No, I am not a veteran. Um, I actually um, came to the VA in 2008, um, and I had some experience working with sexual trauma survivors um, before then. Um, and I... I think being a female, a lot, of, it started with being, seeing a lot of the female veterans who experienced military sexual trauma. And then I was co-leading a group for male survivors. And um, it, I really enjoy that work. I like some of the long-term work with, with the sexual trauma survivors. And then our existing military sexual trauma coordinator left and um, they offered me the job. So I really, I've been in it now for, I guess about 12 years, uh, 11 years. And I, I, it's a great job. And I, I feel like I, um, I feel like it's a good fit and I have a lot of um, kind of empathy for these survivors um, and their courage in coming forward. And even walking into our building and saying this happened to me in the military is not easy. Um, so that's kind of how I came to, to the work. So part of this presentation, um, you know, we've, talked about how we have a double pronged approach in our uh, club that we're trying to talk to the veterans, but we're also trying to talk to the population and educate the population about uh, veterans. And uh, as far as I know, the VA is the largest healthcare provider in the United States. I believe so. So um, what would you say to maybe a, a, a student, someone in college who's looking to maybe join the VA and work with veterans who may not be a veteran themselves? Most of our providers are not veterans. So that is in certainly in no way a barrier. Um, and I think the VA is very uh, committed to hiring staff who have a wide range of backgrounds um, cultural affiliations, you know, our, our military population now is also more and more diverse um, than ever sure. before. 
Um, and so I know that anyone who would like to work through the VA, certainly, um, you know, in mental health, the VA tends to hire social workers and psychologists. Um, so pursuing either of those, often their internship opportunities um, as you're in training to work for the VA. Um, but there are also a lot of administrative positions uh, that I'm not an expert in, you know, sort of non-clinical roles that help support um, education. Um, and even, you know, we have an architect apparently or someone who does manage, you know, so I think there are all sorts of ways that you can help support mm -hmm. veterans. And the veterans until this recent pandemic uh, were very much around. So even someone who, you know, maybe was working, um, in our food service had a lot of regular interactions with veterans and I, I know sort of from what my veterans tell me they often form kind of strong attachments to all the staff members not just their clinicians i have one veteran who talks about um, the housekeeper um, that he makes sure he sees every time he comes to the va um, and like i said i'm not an expert on the administrative roles but there are certainly it's a government agency so there's a lot of management um, so I would say, yeah, look at USA Jobs. Mm -hmm. um, that can transition. I'll, I'll mention. I'll mention this at the end. But we're going to have a presentation from um, uh, our local vet center in Hyannis to talk about um, not only USA Jobs and employment. We're also going to have an education uh, representative there. But they are also a local resource for MST, I believe. Yes, Judith, definitely. can you elaborate on that? The uh, what um, if I'm a veteran and I don't know what I'm ser services I'm eligible for, um, and maybe there is some trauma, um, where can I go? Is, would this be a good place to start a vet center? Absolutely. Um, so I think any VA or vet center is going to be equipped to help of incoming veteran who sort of says, "Hey, I, I'm dropped. I'm dropped off here on your doorstep." help me um, to figure out where we can help them land. Um, the vet center mostly, um, I believe, treats veterans who served in a combat theater, um, as well as MST survivors um, and bereaved families. Um, however, if you walk in the door of a vet center, you know, if they're two blocks away, they are going to help you get to where you need to get to. So I wouldn't not show up if you're like unsure, like, was that a combat theater? You know, like was Honduras a com combat theater? Um, you know, they can answer all those questions and you're not gonna leave there just being told we can't help you. Um, you will be left with a connection to someone, you know, maybe, you know, on the Cape, it might be at the high NSD box or something, but you'll leave with some kind of connection. Um, all the VAs in this area are connected telephonically. So there's, you know, the vet center can easily reach us. There's no, um, I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah. That I was very it. helpful. Um, you can also call um, the VA. Um, our main number here is 401-273-7100. Um, and you can press zero for the operator and you can say, I'm a new veteran looking for services. Can you help me? Um, and they'll probably put you in touch with eligibility, which will verify your eligibility. Um, and, um, and so forth. Um, all veterans also, we do provide um, humanitarian care. So there's a 90 day window for all veterans. So if you just show up at the VA, um, if you're in crisis, you know, I'm obviously speaking to mental health crisis, we can you know, help with some stabilization until we can verify your eligibility and then make referrals from there. One more question. Thank you so much. Um, how is COVID uh, the limitations with all of this um, affected your ability to serve um, the veteran population? That is a great question. And I, it's funny you ask. I have one veteran who I've talked with him on the phone several times. And each time I talk to him, he'll say, so is the VA open yet? And I'll say, the VA was never closed. So the VA has not been closed. Um, <laughs> the VA is fully open and fully operational. Um, we are doing our best to serve veterans um, through video. We have um, you know, our video platform, kind of like a Zoom, where we can have mental health sessions with veterans um, through video, um, just to keep everybody safe. For the most part, veterans like it. They don't even have to leave their home. Veterans from the Cape think it'd be better um, because they don't have to drive to Providence, potentially. Um, we are using telephone support if we need to, um, and we are seeing um, emergencies in person 
Um, and if a veteran, you know, and we're doing a hybrid, sometimes someone says, hey, I really need to, um, you know, come in, um, you know, we're working out. So we're kind of taking it on a case by case and working out what's going on and what will serve each veteran best. Um, I know in mental health, we really haven't had any disruption in services. We sort of picked up at the end of March with the video right away. It was rocky, you know, the videos didn't always work, but we were in touch. Um, so I would tell any veteran, don't, you don't need to wait until COVID is over. Um, our emergency room is fully functional. Um, we have a separate COVID area. So if a veteran needs to come into our emergency room, don't worry that you're gonna be exposed to you know, COVID positive patients, that's not gonna happen. Um, and our urgent care, our walk-in uh, mental health services on our third floor are also fully operational and open to see people in person. Um, if you prefer not to come in in person, but you wanna talk to someone, you can call the VA, you can ask for urgent care and they will set up a video just like this with you, you know, on the spot. I cannot thank you enough for this presentation and for the Q&A um, that we just went through after this. I think it's been really incredible. Um, I want to uh, highlight some of our upcoming events this week before we close. Um, and then I also wanna say some thanks. So first today at three, uh, segueing right into uh, the Vet Center, we have Adam Doefler and uh, several other Cape Cod subject matter experts that are going to be talking to us about the awareness of programs and services to veterans on Cape Cod. So um, Judith Berger just put on an incredible presentation of what she does. And what we're going to be talking about at three is a streamlined path to get to uh, specialists like her and other individuals like her that are, are here to help and ready to help. Tomorrow we have uh, at 10, Service Color and Photography, a Vietnam veteran who's gonna be talking about uh, trials and tribulations since he came back. And then at 3 p.m. tomorrow, nope, that was today. No, I'm sorry. At 3 p.m. tomorrow, we have uh, Michaela Black from the VA who is going to be talking to us about the VA GI Bill and vr &E system, which is going to be an incredible, incredible presentation. The first half is going to be catered towards faculty staff and the second half more towards your student general public. So you do not have to be a veteran to show up at this. We can, you know, keep learning more about the veteran problems, uh, tribulations. Wednesday, we will be observing Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day. Get some free food if you're a veteran. Uh, and then Thursday, we are extremely excited to have a, 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 a local Korean War veteran, Purple Heart Silver Star recipient, uh, recently wrote a book with his son, Charles and Chuck, Chuck and Charles, Chuck and Charles Daly. Uh, what we have titled this presentation, What Can I Do for My Country Now? Um, and he is here to talk to us about his service in the Korean War and all the incredible things he has done since. And I hope that this whole week is really going to show us that there are resources available for us. We can get help and we can keep going forward. We can, what can I do for my country now? So Judith, nothing but thank you so much. You have been so incredible to work through with all of this. Um, thank you. I know it's been short notice. Uh, John Alexander is our uh, veteran and military services advisor at the college. Thank you so much, John, for your help with not only this presentation the whole week. Also, the Tilden Arts Events Department. Thank you so much. Uh, Vana has been leading that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, couldn't have done any of this without you. And then also, President Cox, thank you so much for your support through this. And also, your video at the beginning was beautiful. Thank you so much.